Uh, Life Abraham is the co-CEO of investing social network public.com. Prior to public, he was co-founder and CEO of Andco, which he grew to become the largest freelancing software in the world. Andco was acquired by Fiverr in 2018. He also co-founded Pay with a Tweet, a first of its kind social payment system that was acquired by Hans Ventures in 2012. Previously, Life was a partner at a venture studio pre-hype and has held senior roles in product strategy at RGA and West, where he worked on product experience for companies like Radio, Google, Venmo, and more. Life's also an investor in companies like Row Health, part of the First Mark family, Forum, and Catch. He's also an advisor to the seed investment fund to Urban.us. He was named to the top 10 minds in digital by Adweek is a double con lion grand prix winner and has won an MTV O Music Award, which I don't have a question about, but I might have to add one because I'm now I'm curious about that. Well, Life, thanks so much for being here. Welcome to Design Driven. Cool, thanks. What's up? Um, so first of all, where, where are you joining us from today? Where, where are you based? In New York, uh, Berry Park City, kind of Tribeca. It's a little bit like the suburb that's attached to Manhattan. Awesome. And, and just before we dive into the questions, I'm curious, where, where is the team at, of public based? Are they, are they all over? Or are there hubs? How do you guys think about that? Yeah, so headquarters in New York. Um, we do have an office in Copenhagen as well. Uh, so my co-founder Janik is Danish. And so his old CTO, Tobias from his old company, he also joined us, our CTO now. And so that's why we built like a backend engineering office in Copenhagen around him as well. Um, and then we have a few people distributed, right? A few in California, we have a few in Portugal, we have a few in Argentina, a few just like in other cities in the US, but New York is definitely the headquarter. Awesome. And do you guys think about those different geos functionally, like functional specific, or are they it, it, are there kind of functions of all of all teams across those those places? Um, it depends. So, for example, we just started an office in Raleigh, North Carolina, which will be mostly customer service, for example. Um, gotcha. We will build that out also for other roles as well. But like the focus there was customer service. And then, you know, just Copenhagen happened to become one of the engineering hubs because of Tobias, our CTO, being there. Right. Um, but other than that, not really. And the thing is, just like throughout COVID, we always had the sense of that, you know, we were always saying that we are operating with, you know, optimism to the future. So we said we're not yeah. going to become a fully remote company suddenly. And, right. um, but still with that, you had certain talent come up that you couldn't say, you know, no to. And then if they want to be remote somewhere, then obviously we, you know, try to make that happen and try to right. make it work. And so as we go back to an office now, we'll see how that kind of falls all into place. But, but generally speaking, we're, we're trying to be within offices, um, you know, uh, in the different hubs where we're at. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, let's dive in. So I'd love to start by rewinding the clock a little bit and hear a little bit about your early story, your early childhood, um, your upbringing, and how, if at all, that kind of influenced your trajectory into tech? So I'm German. That's where the beautiful, you know, accent comes from, if you haven't realized. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but I moved to the US in 08, right? And so um, been most of my adult life in, uh, in the US. And then back in Germany, I used to work in ad agencies. And then where it was very, very young, started, you know, I think nowadays we call it a startup. I didn't know what it was called a startup uh, at that time, but I was kind of, you know, tinkering around and building some internet businesses when I was uh, literally a teenager. And, um, um, but yeah, but generally, obviously, you know, still European, there's still an accent there and so on. But that's a, that's a very quick one. Awesome. And then what was your, so, you know, you, you've started a number of companies. What was the first one and how did, how did that, you know, how did, what was the story there? How did that start? Yeah, I mean, so the first thing I think was really this like, you know, ad network for gaming that I started literally out of my kid's room. So um, I just kind of fell into building websites and, you know, learning Photoshop myself and stuff like that. And I was 14 years old when that started or so, and just, you know, yeah. something like that. And then from there, I stumbled just over over just affiliate marketing at the time. And yep. it, it just became, you know, there was, I don't know, 99, 98 or something like that. And then, um, um, and so I just stumbled over these ways of how you could suddenly make money with your website online. And right. because I was a kid, out of my kid's room, I basically started a website about video games because that's what you do when you're, when you're a child, I guess. Yep. And, um, but I had like a kind of a lucky hand with 
uh, just starting to just, just, we're just like making money with all these weird affiliate marketing schemes that I'm not going to talk about on, on, uh, on the record here, but over a beer one day, I will <laughs> yeah. tell you the stories. Yeah. And, um, uh, so I, I just started making this money and I had still this, this like game website going on. So I started using the money to fund these other fan sites for video games. There was like, you know, one specifically for Grand Theft Auto, one specifically for, you know, Counter-Strike and stuff like that. Gotcha. And because they were started by kids like myself of the kids room. So right. I funded these sites and then in exchange um, for basically paying for all the expenses, giving them server space, which was crazy expensive at the time, like AWS didn't really exist and so on, right? Um, and in exchange got the exclusive rights of all the ad placements. And then I kind of turned that into an ad network specifically for gaming. Um, and um, and that was kind of like the first, you know, real business. Even though the ad network itself didn't really turn out to be a good business, all the affiliate gotcha. hustle was much more, but that was like the first basically. And that's how I kind of stumbled into it. And, and for, for that, you know, kind of uh, early entrepreneurial time in your life, did you actually have like a small team? Did you have friends that you worked with this on? Or was it really just you running this time? That was mostly just me. It was mostly just me. And it was also funny. It was like, it's obviously like I was designing everything. I was coding everything and whatnot. And, um, but it was funny because at like the peak of it, I was maybe like 16, 17 or so. Yeah. And I was making all these deals with all these ad networks and so on, even though I wasn't even, you know, at, you know, legal <laughs> age yet. Right. And so in theory, all these contracts were basically, you know, um, not actually legally binding and whatnot, but they yeah. had no idea, yeah. obviously, because, you know, they, they, like, they wouldn't think that they are talking to some kids in literally their kids' room with toys around. Right. <laughs> and so, but, um, uh, but yeah. And then, so you you went on to start a few other companies. You had GMP, Pay with a Tweet, and Anco. Most most you know kind of uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, prestigiously. What what's maybe uh, one lesson that you learned from each of those kind of journeys? Was there one that you learned from the ad network that you then applied mm -hmm. to the next one? And how do you think about using kind of the lessons you learn as an entrepreneur for future endeavors? Hey, I mean the. My first upbringing when I was like sitting there in my kid's room, I would definitely say hustle. Um, just the grind. Like I just remember these times I was just like, because it was just a fun just to build stuff. But I was like right. grinding through nights and nights. I always have this, this, this remembrance of like putting a pizza in the oven somewhere and just starting to smell it because I forgot about it. And, <laughs> uh, and it just happened all the effing time. Yeah. And, um, and I think also just a sense of just literally, you know, picking up the telephone. I was like barely cold emails. I remember I was just always calling, just calling people up directly and just, you know, and it was also like my hack to get free games at the time was to just right. call up the game publishers and be like, Hey, you know, I have the site. No, no, no. I need a, you know, like I need a free copy of this game in order to write a review about it. Nah, nah, nah. And like, right. oh, does it work? And so it was like also my hack to just get, you know, free games. And I did a music side to get the same done for music to just get free music all the time. And, um, but so I would, def I would definitely say just like hustle and grind. I think that was a big yeah. Then with pay with the tweet. So pay with the tweet was funny because um, so my buddy and I, so I ended up in agency land afterwards and like on the digital side. And that was like my start this gaming thing, closed that down, ended up in agency land back in Germany first and then moved to the Esprit. And my buddy and I, um, we wrote this book about basically like the shift in marketing, especially like brand marketing to like use digital and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And that was in 08 or 09 or so, and right after we moved to the US. And, um, um, but obviously no one really knew us or anything. And right. so, um, and so the, the thought was like, cool, but what if anyone, like what would, like what if everyone would just tweet about this book? That was kind of like the goal then. Twitter was just becoming big, right? And then, yep. so just everyone would just tweet about it. And that's how then Pay the Tweet was born, which then turned into an own product, which then kind of blew up on its own. So every major, any major record label used to give songs away. The internet we could use it to, you know, uh, give discounts on tickets. Mitt Romney used it when he ran for president. Sorry about that, nothing happened, so all fine. But uh, <laughs> it didn't, it wasn't, uh, it didn't, it didn't work out well enough, I guess. But um, and so that thing just blew up organically. And I think the 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 main thing that I learned there is number one, just the power of an organic growth engine. Yeah. Um, because you know, I, like our like our book itself had I think three hundred fifty thousand downloads or something within yeah. a few weeks which was wow. just for something that, you know, um, and I think it was all just driven by the system basically. And I think the other thing was just framing um, because 
the thing was called pay with a tweet and just by framing it as a payment, everyone had a very different view on it. Like we could have called uh, it, you know, the viral marketing machine or something. Right, right. Um, right. But by framing it as a payment and also when we put the book out, we put the book on Amazon and whatnot, it had an actual price tag to it. And then you had to pay with a tweet button next to that. And so you had this framing of, oh, so you spend 20 bucks on getting the actual physical book or you get it for a tweet. And so what's the value of this tweet now? Is it 20 bucks or, you know? Right. And so right. that framing actually created a ton of press because it just unlocked a certain thinking around it that people could kind of latch on um, to write stories around and all that kind of stuff. And so yeah. I think like just the, the, also just like the power of the right framing there, I think it's another good learning. I love that. But yeah. And then, and then, Enco, yeah, and then, yeah, Enco, yeah, we'd love yeah, to hear. So yeah, so, so Enco, Enco was freelancing software, right? So basically, you know, it still exists under Fiverr now, obviously. And um, it was like invoicing, contracts, task management, typical SaaS software tool. Um, one thing that I always say that I kind of learned for myself out of it and um, was that um, when you start something to truly recognize that, will you be passionate about the day-to-day -day work? Because I was mm. very passionate about the sense of like future of work. And when I was like right. VCs, like I love pitching VCs because right. we were talking about the future of work and like had these like grand, you know, kind of strategies, et cetera, et cetera. But the day to day, it was like SEO articles on invoicing. Right. And, uh, um, and so on. And, um, and the way I now frame it afterwards for me is the sense of, so when you start something, would you enjoy having a dinner with your customers? Like the conversations of what happened around mm. your product with those customers would you actually enjoy that dinner, right? right. If I think of right. it, so at Anko, that dinner would have been, you know, a bunch of freelancers basically talking about, you know, how to get a client to pay you better and things like yep. that, you know, because that was what I was solving or, or trying to solve with the product. And, you know, I liked the intellectual challenge of building the product, like the intellectual challenge of building the company and, you know, building that vision out and whatnot. But, um, but I don't know if I would have truly enjoyed or been passionate about it enough to truly enjoy that dinner. Right. And, that's, and I think that's, for example, something that's very different with public now, where like, you know, if I would have a dinner right now with our users, we would talk about, you know, Amazon's earnings report and things like that. Right. You know, right. I, would, I would enjoy the shit out of that. Yeah. So, so. I love that. I love that. That's a fantastic framework, framework. I've never heard that before. And, and, I, and I have a lot of questions on it, but I want to dive into some public stuff because that's why you're here. So maybe just a quick synopsis for folks that aren't familiar with public yet. What's the short of, you know, what you guys have created in this social investing platform? Yeah. So I always say the reason why people haven't necessarily invested in the stock market is not necessarily commissions or because it hasn't been pretty on a mobile phone, but because they don't feel the stock market is for them. And mm. I think that's one of the big anecdotes we always hear of like, before I joined public, I just didn't think this was for me. I'm not a finance right. person. I don't really understand this stuff. I don't know what the acronyms mean. I'm, you know, kind of like afraid of losing money, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and I think uh, um, um, a big piece there is that if you think of active investing in the stock market, you think of stock trading. And right. stock trading historically has been not necessarily the most inviting culture, right? It's pretty like white bro dominated, you know, it's Wolf of Wall Street memes, David Day Trader on Twitter and things like that. Right. And that is just, you know, for most people, it's not very, that's just not very inviting, you know, and right. very heavily speculative, right? It's more short term speculative and so on. And when people think about investing, they think about, your, you know, your Schwab, your Vanguard, your wealth fund, stash money away somewhere, and never touch it or whatnot. But you also don't learn anything. And I think you never, and I think you don't really have an emotional connection to your investments and therefore also have the, you know, have, have the drive to learn if you're just right. putting, if you're just putting your money into a black box where like it's being taken care of. Right. Yeah. And it's a good strategy for many people in terms of investing in general, no investment advice here, blah, 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 the legal speaking, yep. you know, but, uh, 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 but generally I think there's this, there's a sense of that you just don't learn anything really from it. And, and so, right. and so therefore like how much do you really gain out of it even just personally? And so, and so with that, we kind of thought first off, in order to build a mass consumer company in the space, you first have to make the stock market itself a mass consumer product. Right. And, um, and with that, um, you have to make the experience something that is much more approachable. So not just accessible. I think when people talk about de um, democratization, they think of like, make it free and make everything right. available for someone, you know? But I think approachability comes from more than just pure UI design and whatnot. Approachability comes from framing, right? Comes from who do you experience it with? Uh, right. It comes from 
how you know the product in general is 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 uh, is presented, how you find out about it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's for us a big reason why you know we uh, you know have celebrity investors, why we're trying yep. to align a little bit closer to pop culture. You know, and like in marketing, we literally, if you go to public.com slash drops, we literally have these like wacky drops like a Supreme would do and stuff like that. <laughs> and, okay. um, but all that is, is, is really just, you know, um, you know, a tactic to, to, to make the stock, to, to align the stock market closer to pop culture. Yeah. Therefore, make there's it comfortable for people. There's one, one question I have for you is, you know, I think a lot of uh, the preconceived notions about investing is that it's a very private activity, right? It's something that you do. You know, you, you might not even talk about it with your family or your loved one or whoever you're it's, it's your money, you're investing it. Um, how, how have you guys thought about building that trust and convincing users that I mean, because at the core of public, I know there's a private option to be able to not post publicly what you're sharing. But so much of the differentiation is in that social graph of seeing what everyone else is investing in. So just talk me through a little bit about how you guys think about that. I think that that assumption is just wrong and that it's just an assumption that people somehow had because, yeah. um, but it's not necessarily true. I think it's true when it comes to the questions of talking about how much money you have in your bank account or something, yep. you know, that is obviously highly private, but I think people do like to talk about investments and they do like to, you know, um, uh, you know, share their strategies and break things down and whatnot. And I think, especially when you're new to the stock market, that exchange is how you learn. Right. And right. You know, again, like in public, when you when you like when you join and sign up and so on, you you see even just by the people you're surrounded by, it's way more welcoming to people who are new to the stock market. You kind of learn from other people's experience, from their anecdotes, potentially even, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And and that just again makes it more approachable as well. And so yeah. I think that the sense of that people don't like to talk about what they're investing in and stuff, I would say that's just a wrong assumption. It's just and it's actually not true. And we have not seen it either. You know, yeah. people are yeah. highly social about this uh, around the stock market. And, and how do you guys think about, because I mean, such a large part of training new investors and, and, and building that trust with them is providing them with financial education, right, around, you know, what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad, what to really take, you know, stock in, what not to. Um, how do you guys think about education as part of the product at public? Because it seems to be such a core piece. And I know recent launches, even like Public Hall, trying to get you know, the consumer closer to the executives of these companies. So just curious how you guys think about education. Yeah. So I personally sucked in school and I sucked in school because I, I was just not good at theoretical learning. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I'm basically, I'm a design school dropout. So to say, I, you know, had to redo um, one of the, you know, levels in, how do you call this, you know, one of the classes yeah, in, yeah. in high school and all that, like I sucked at school. I'm not a good student. Um, but I was very good in like learning by doing, right? And that's also why I was able to just, you know, teach myself some coding, teach myself some design and like suddenly, you know, build something out of a kid's room that, make, that suddenly made money and things like that. Right. And I think um, it's, and I think that is just true for general, you know, building any type of literacy is the sense of that learning by doing and the ability to curate your own experience in a way that fits for how you like to learn and how you like to comprehend things. Um, um, you know, is I think where kind of that that kind of power lies, right? And so, right. what's the combination of fractional investing, aka the ability to buy any stock with any amount of money, and therefore you for therefore you for you to be able to have all the big investing strategies that you would normally only have with a few hundred thousand dollars in your portfolio, you can now do with fifty bucks. Right. That ability number one, and then on top the exchange and the way for you to follow people that break something down a certain way follow people that might be, you know, talking about more, you know, in a little bit more entertaining fashion for you, or they might be super numbers driven, or, you know, people that are the same level as you is because you rather want to have a gym buddy than a personal trainer and things like that. And then being able to create that experience that way, I think is a powerful kind of just hook to build general literacy. And then I think, you know, I think the other piece around it is that, um, is that you see right now, um, you see right now um, with like GameStop and Dogecoin and whatnot, you yep. see obviously that the barrier of getting started is actually quite low right now because right. people right. want to be part of this movement. They want to, you know, also put their money to AMC apparently today, which went up 40% or something, right. you know, and so on. And, um, and, and therefore, you know, there is this kind of like cultural, you know, pop cultural thing going on right now where right. actually the psychological barrier to get started is actually quite low, but it's built on speculation. 
It's right, not built right, on exactly. actually sound investing principles or whatnot. It's built on speculation and being part of this cool thing that's going on, put a little gamble out and whatnot. Right. And right. I think the, the thing there is that it's a question of, so when these, when people do that, and that's the first experience and their first kind of tipping their toes into the stock market, it's easy to suddenly get burned. And right. so as they get started, what is the experience that they're exposed to then in that moment? And what right. we kind of, you know, and what we kind of see is that, hey, if someone joins public, because it's also a community, because you have content built around it and whatnot, you know, GameStop might be where you got started and what pulled you in, but now you're exposed to, you know, a more investing culture and you will likely or hopefully end up, you know, building a more diversified portfolio and having a, you know, a Fortune 500 company in your, you know, right. or, uh, in, your, in your portfolio suddenly versus only GameStop as the only stock right. and things like that. And so I think the, the education layer is not just a sense of, hey, build your long-term literacy, but it's also, um, you know, how can you kind of bridge that gap from this like speculative kind of trend that's going on right now into right. actually creating investors out of it? Right, right, right. That's a great point. All right. Well, we're uh, we're flying through this. I, I is so so many questions that we're probably not going to be able to get to, but I want to do a few more and then we'll jump over to audience Q and A. So, audience, if you have questions for life, by all means, drop them in the Q and A portal. We'll get to a couple in a few minutes. Um, but I wanted to pivot to your journey as a, fa as, as a you know, CEO, a leader of public um, with respect to the team. So you said in previous interviews that you, you uh, look for tenacity and humility in your employees. How, what questions do you ask them in the hiring process to suss that out? Are there you know, uh, take home things that you do with them or are there certain questions that you love to ask? Like, just curious. I think it's super tough and it's often just, you know, what kind of feeling do you get for the person? The one thing I, I, I sometimes, you know, kind of recognize and like people want to sell themselves in an interview as well, obviously, right. but like I personally like it a lot when people, when, like when you ask like, Hey, describe what you kind of did and like this project and whatnot. And they use we and not I. And like ah, we did yep. na, 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 versus I did da 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 da. And it's Love like it's a, yep. it's a tiny little thing, and it doesn't mean that if you don't use it, you right, know, right, right. But like, but like generally, I like that a lot. And I think just um, in my experience, humbleness is one of the most underrated skills because I yep. think, especially in 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 you know, especially in work environments, and maybe a little bit less when people are remote, but in offices and whatnot, right? People who are loud, people who talk the most, people who lift their hands the most in meetings and whatnot, you know, just you know, obviously can drain the voices of people who are, you know, who are maybe not as loud. And then suddenly, yeah. you know, um, and so uh, a buddy of mine, we always had this little saying of um, which is like in German saying for who writes stays. And it's the sense of that, hey, if, you know, uh, the person that like replies to the, to the, to the, to the, to the all company email right away, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like that. And it's just like, oh, you know, the person that just wants to be really loud and wants to be seen all the time. And then no, 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 right. no. and um, but I think humbleness is one of the is one of the skills where where you kind of recognize that most cases humble people care about the work more than they care about themselves in that regard. And right. I think that's that's a that's a very, very powerful trait. I love that. All right. Well, uh, quick lightning round uh, of final questions for me, and then we'll jump over to one or two questions from the audience. But um, what is one tool, personal or professional, that you can't live without and that more founders should utilize? My Sublime Text Editor. Sublime Text Editor? That's amazing. Really? Okay, great. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, well, there you go. Um, there you go. What is the, what's the biggest misconception that people have about public that you, that you want to kind of debunk? They were similar to Robinhood. There you go. What would be that? What would be the elevator reasoning behind you not being similar? <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna have to, I have to figure out how to like, how to phrase this. Yeah, take your, take your time. Doesn't not be harsh. Be not be harsh. Hey, right. um, I think incent. I think your your incentives drive you, and therefore your business model, you know, drives your actions. And yep. um, in our case, we've, you know, made some public moves, obviously no pun intended, you know, around things like payment for order flow and whatnot. Yep. And I think that drives the culture you're building internally, that drives you, how you design product, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, in that case, it's a sense of, you know, the more you align your business model with the interests of your customers, I think the longer you're going to be around. And if you want to build a, 
you know, multi-generational company, um, I think that's the only way to do it because, you know, if you don't run a clean shop, it's going to come out. Yeah. Come out that. and it's not going to grow forever. I and, um, and so I think that's, you know, and that just shows in how we execute the products we offer and which we don't offer. Right. And things like yep. that. Yep. Awesome. And then the last one is uh, what's next for public. What should folks, I know you guys are shipping a lot of features, awesome sub products. Like what, what next is coming? What should folks get excited about if they're already public users? Hey, crypto is coming, right? We're getting asked 440 times a day. So <laughs> crypto is coming, okay. crypto is coming. <laughs> Stay tuned. Great. Um, hey, we launched a few cool features recently, right? You mentioned Town Hall, which is basically like a Q&A where public company CEOs answer questions of uh, investors. I think that has been that has been awesome. It's also just awesome to see um, what different questions you know, basically retail investors ask was what you hear on, on, on earnings reports, right? When the one yep. with, with uh, Chai from Lemonade, um, I think someone asked, um, how do you hire? Right. Which I think was, you know, he gave a super detailed, you know, right, you know, right, right. answer and whatnot. And I think just there you kind of recognize, you know, that, that I think retail investors also, or like a lot of retail investors, they, they also think more deeper around like the culture of the company. And right. things like that, which I think you will never truly see so much on some, you know, uh, from, yeah, that's from really some palace on some on some on some earnings call, right? I love that. So I think that was. Um, we've got we've got one question from Daniel in the Q and A, um, and he's asking. He's saying the popular crypto exchange Coinbase has a program called Earn, where they give out crypto in exchange for learning about different coins. Has public looked at similar ways to reward people, uh, you know, or or kind of gamify, you know, new investors learning about personal finance and investing? Great question, Daniel. A hundred percent, and um, there is something big coming. Okay, all right. Here you go. <laughs> we don't know what. I love it. Look at Daniel hit it right on the hit it right <laughs> on the head. I love it. Um, awesome. Well, if there's time for one more question, uh, looks like okay. We've got one more in from Anita. Um, hi there. I think the ticker time machine on the app is super cool and fun. Do people use it a lot? Um, so for a sticker time machine is this like little, it's kind of one of our drops in a way. So it's this, it's this yep. app we built app slash web app where you can just like type in a stock and when you would have invested and then it shows you how much money you have gotten or lost, you know? Gotcha. And yep. so, um, um, Hey, this is like one of our kind of like marketing drops more than it is, you know, a right. true, like, like a true utility. Right. So that thing kind of apps and flows depending on whatever kind of circles it hits. Like with all of these drops, the way I always refer to it is basically they kind of like boy bands in the nineties. Um, <laughs> it's that yeah. it's that you're trying to optimize for what could go right in terms of right. like could go viral or whatnot, but you truly never know beforehand. And so you kind of right. have to throw ten against the wall. You know, three might stick, and you know, two of them will have a hit single, and one of them will become the Backstreet Boys, and you know, some of them will will send you traffic forever and ever and you know some of them yeah. will uh you know have a little viral quick moments on twitter and then they kind of drift off and then one day someone tweets them you're like oh holy shit this thing had a few thousand dividends again <laughs> right and so uh, and so i think that's you know and so i think ticker time machine just falls into one of those awesome well uh life thank you so much for spending some time with design driven i know it was short i wish it could have been you know double but uh we appreciate you spending some time with us and waving at you from the other side of New York City. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll catch up at some point. And congratulations also on just all of public's incredible success. Um, you know, as a, as a happy user, it's, it's a really, truly beautiful product and um, you guys have built something special. So really appreciate you being here today. And uh, thanks again for joining us. Nice. Thanks, Jack. See nice. you later. Yeah.